I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about a common procedure we perform here at the Liver and Pancreas Tumor Center called a distal pancreatectomy. Distal pancreatectomy is a procedure where you remove the left side of the pancreas and that can be done for a number of different reasons. I'd like to show you this uh, uh, picture that I drew of the pancreas and as you see here the distal pancreas which is the tail of the pancreas is in this area here. You'll notice here the spleen and the stomach. The pancreas lies behind the stomach and the tail of it is nestled in the spleen. Now we do distal pancreatectomies for a number of, of, of indications and we'll specifically go over uh, in your particular case what that indication is. For example, you can have a tumor here called a neuroendocrine tumor and that can be a reason that the pancreas is uh, uh, being removed. The other common thing that we see are cysts of the pancreas where you have a fluid filled or mucus filled uh, cyst and these cysts can be either precancerous or cancerous and that's another common indication for removing the tail of the pancreas. A third common indication would be as if you have an actual cancer of the pancreas for example, there's a, there would be a mass here and a more solid appearing tumor, but all of the uh, uh, indications, uh, the procedure is basically very similar, whichever the indication. But we'll talk specifically about your particular type of tumor and, and the follow-up uh, for that. But for a distal pancreatectomy, uh, the, what I'd like to uh, show is actually what the procedure entails. So, the, the distal pancreas is typically removed up to this point here, which would be the neck of the pancreas, and that's on top of some major uh, blood vessels right behind the neck. So the tail of the pancreas is removed. There are two versions of this. One would be a splenic preserving distal pancreatectomy, and the other would include both removal of the spleen and the pancreas. A lot of that is determined by the type of tumor you have. If it's a more benign or precancerous tumor, we may be, do what's called a splenic preserving, where we actually just remove the tail of the pancreas. However, if it's a cancerous or suspected to be a cancerous tumor, we will remove the spleen along with the pancreas for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that there are a lot of lymph nodes that are around the tail of the pancreas. And these lymph nodes, if we remove the spleen as well as the tail of the pancreas will get more, will remove more lymph nodes, which will be tested uh, by the pathologist. The other reason that the spleen oftentimes has to be removed is because the blood vessels that go to the spleen, the artery that goes to the spleen, and the vein that drains the blood back from the spleen run right behind the pancreas. And in order to get the tumor out and to remove the lymph nodes, you would have to remove the artery in the vein that goes to the spleen. And obviously the spleen, if the spleen doesn't have blood flow, uh, it can't survive. So it's often that we have to remove the spleen with the uh, 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 tail of the pancreas. So basically here, we would be removing this area here, including the um, uh, neck, body, and tail of the pancreas and the spleen. Now, if there's a situation where there's a small tumor on the very, very tail, we may just be able to remove that section. But in general, this would be uh, the uh, distal pancreatectomy. The stomach is just moved out of the way. You don't have to actually remove any of the stomach unless, of course, it's a larger tumor that's directly involving the stomach. Now, <clears throat> the, once the tail of the pancreas is removed, that's the first part of the surgery, which generally takes a few hours. And this can be done either minimally invasively or laparoscopically, uh, and we'll go over the best application in, in your particular case. Sometimes we do what's called a hybrid, where we do the procedure laparoscopically, but then the very last part of it, we make a small incision and remove the, the, the tumor out through that small incision and also use it to close the pancreatic duct. Now, the, the, this part of the surgery well, takes a few hours. Um, the, a couple of things, though, I want to mention that are, are particularly important to this operation. You'll notice here that once the tail of the pancreas has been removed, there's a stump or end of the pancreas. And the, the pancreas, as you know, makes digestive juices. And this stump of the pancreas, because the pancreas is a very soft gland, one of the complications that we see after the surgery is leakage from the uh, 
uh, pancreas. Now that happens anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of the time, so it's not uncommon that this happens. What we'll do at the time of the surgery is we'll put a drain. This little drain here will have some side holes in it, and this will be coming out of your left side to a small plastic soft, it's, it's a soft uh, rubbery drain, and it's hooked to a small uh, container that you'll take uh, home if necessary. The majority of these are removed in the hospital after a few days, but in the case that there is some persistent drainage, you may have to go with, home with it, and we'll, we'll of course teach you how to use it, empty it, and record it. But leakage from the pancreatic juice leakage from the uh, uh, stump of the pancreas hopefully will be brought out through this drain. Uh, if the drainage is, is very low, we'll take the drain out after a few days, uh, otherwise we'll leave it in. But this is the biggest problem that we see after this operation. If you do get leakage from this, most of these can be managed non-operatively. Sometimes we do have to take patients down to the interventional radiology uh, suite down on the second floor and do a drainage either by ultrasound or by CT because what will happen is you'll get a pocket of fluid here that will accumulate around there and that will have to be uh, drained and aspirated uh, and then uh, patients can usually go home and then we take the drain out in the, uh, in the clinic. Now usually these are, are not a big problem but sometimes they can get infected and if that does happen then that could prolong your hospital stay. Uh, it also could lead to having to come back uh, for readmission if that happens. So we do give patients antibiotics, of course, prior to surgery, but the, that is something that, that can happen. Now the other thing uh, I, I want to mention is uh, because the stomach sits right next to the pancreas, and this is the surgical area here, we will see cases where you will have something called delayed gastric emptying, where because the stomach is sitting right next to where the surgery occurred, the stomach may be slow to empty. So you may feel full uh, 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 more quickly or have uh, some uh, you know, upper abdominal uh, discomfort such that you, you will be not wanting to eat as much. So that happens in about 15 to 20 percent of the cases, especially when you uh, have a problem with fluid collection or, or leak uh, from this. But the majority of patients get through this surgery quite well. The hospital stay should be approximately uh, five days and uh, most patients will go home either on a regular diet or a low fat diet. And uh, you can certainly, we'll give you more instructions on that uh, at the time of your hospital stay. And of course you'll have a meet with a dietitian. Uh, that will go over this again with you. I would encourage you after the surgery to eat smaller meals more frequently. That always uh, helps. The other thing that I'd like to mention about this particular procedure is the fact that the pancreas does make insulin and the tail of the pancreas has about 60 percent of the insulin production. So if you're a diabetic, it is possible that this procedure could increase your need for either pills or insulin. If you're not a diabetic and you don't have any sugar problems, the vast majority of patients will not have problems with blood sugar. Certainly someone who is not a diabetic is very unlikely to need insulin. However, if you are on uh, oral uh, sugar pills, you may need to be on higher doses or at an additional medicine or you may even need insulin. Most of the patients that have this surgery may need some insulin in the hospital. Uh, however, that's not always the case when you go home. So it, 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 may, it will depend on whether or not you do have some pre-existing blood sugar problems as to whether or not you'll be one of those that needs insulin or, or pills after this surgery. The pancreas also makes digestive juices which help with the digestion of food. The head of the pancreas, which is the part of the pancreas that is spared in this particular surgery, makes more of the digestive juices. So the majority of patients who have the left side of their pancreas or their distal pancreas removed to the tail will not need enzyme replacement. But it may be a situation where if you do have some underlying pancreas problems, for example pancreatitis, uh, that you may need some enzyme replacement. But again, that's, that's, that's fairly unusual. Uh, the distal pancreatectomy is done either with removal of the spleen or sometimes without removal of the spleen. Sometimes we don't know if the spleen is going to be removed, so all patients who are scheduled to have the uh, tail of their pancreas removed will get vaccines. Now, this is a three, three vaccines called a trivalent vaccine, 
and the vaccine is for a, a pneumococcal vaccine, an H flu vaccine, not the virus flu, but the bacterial uh, type of flu vaccine, and a meningitis vaccine. And this is given as a simple shot. Uh, we give it a, a, at least a week or two prior to surgery. And what that does is protect against the, uh, certain types of infections. The spleen is very important in younger uh, uh, adolescents and children uh, because it's a, it has a very important immune function. As we get older, the spleen has less and less uh, importance in our lives. However, there is some uh, immune function that the spleen does have, and that's why we give you the vaccine. We'll recommend that you have that vaccine redone in about eight years, but that should protect against most serious infections that occur after having your spleen removed. The incidence of infection after splenectomy is very, very low. It's less than 1%. But your family doctor definitely needs to be aware that your spleen has been removed as he may manage you differently with antibiotics should you develop some other sort of infection after uh, your, your surgery. So that the, sp uh, the splenectomy vaccine is just in, in case that we do have to remove your spleen to help fight uh, any infections that might occur after the surgery.